Hello and welcome back to OT the Podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, and how to spend it reading Jason Heaton's latest novel, Sweetwater. Well, we're not reading it yet. We're going to wait for it to arrive in the post. Uh, I'm Philly Schultz. I don't know. Do we still do that? Yeah. Um, for those just, new here. I want to be more like TGN. Can we mm. like be cooler? How do we make that happen? We need, I think we need to spend a lot of time with Jason and James. Just, just being like chill. I think you're born... At their level of cool, I think you're born that way. And I think you can, um, it can't be learned, it can't be taught. It's a, it's a state of being. But Jason did, yeah, I didn't think Jason could get cooler. And then it turns out, big alone fan, just like you and I, Felix. Probably Obviously. Now. Obviously. Makes total I mean, sense. And I, I love that, without giving any spoilers away, I love that he backs himself on there. He's got, he's I got also confidence. I suspect that, that, um, I, can't, I can't really imagine Jason Heaton binging something. I reckon he like he stops whittling, <laughs> stops brewing his own whiskey, turns on, the, <laughs> cranks up the TV mm. to to watch uh, one only one episode of Alone at a time. No, no, I reckon we'll those, those awesome. long those long winters. I think he oh. smashes it out. Um, anyway, enough about okay. Alone. We're not alone. I've got you. You've got me, and we've got Jason. We do. We've also got a, a, a chat uh, coming up with uh, just you and me. No Mike Pearson this week. He's left us. He's got other things to be doing. Yeah. Uh, but we're still talking about Zodiac. Uh, we're talking about colour, fun. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Before that, mm. um, update, Andy. Mm-hmm. Update from the uh, perennially popular episode with Alan Hammerblore, uh, yep. as seen on Hodinky. Um, his, the first part, like the actual auction auction part has, has finished. There's still some available online. Uh, 95% of the lot sold earning a cool 1.6 million, which, um, I, you know, suspect will, will do some sort of genuinely positive work in the Australian community, uh, which is great. Good result. Yeah. He seems to be, he seems to be happy with the, with the outcome and sort of the has he updated? I haven't seen his socials. Has he? Yeah, yeah. I think he sort of he sort of enjoyed the catch up. I think it's given him opportunity. A lot of his friends have flown in. A lot of people have come in from all over the nice. world to sort of be there to bid on things, and he's got to meet uh, a whole lot of people, which I think has probably been quite special. Yep. Um, I think it's probably been a bit of a strange experience, but I Wouldn't think be. he's I think he's having uh, having a good time over there and sort of probably letting letting go of a lot of things. So. Yeah, and the reception to him has been amazing. Everyone, everyone is bringing it up and messaging us. So, I mean, yeah, and it's it's, it's a, a timely reminder, you know, about what what can be a very very commercial mm. uh, and sort of status driven uh, hobby or you know pursuit. Yeah, it doesn't just have to be that. It can be more. Speaking of commercials, this week's episode of OT the Podcast <laughs> is brought to you by Zodiac Watches. We couldn't do it without our sponsors and without support. So we are we are forever grateful to, to those brands that do join us. Mike Pearson, he's been around watches for 10 years. You've heard him last week and the week before. He's at Zodiac. He's doing great work. And we are, I'm, I'm personally quite happy to have Zodiac on board, Felix. You mentioned colour and bold design. What's happening on that front? Well, look, I mean, for me, uh, look... Uh uh, on, I'm wearing at the moment the most colourful watch combination I can manage. Uh, it's a Zodiac Super Sea Wolf that I believe is referred to as the watermelon um, on a on a rainbow NATO. But Zodiac, as we you know we've sort of discussed with Mike, they do colour really well, and yep. I think brands have you know a few sort of hallmarks like you know in Bulgari do ultra thin and. Other people do other things, but Zodiac, I think one of the first things you think about is their use of interesting colours. Like they're not just playing with the same four primary colours that most Swiss brands do, uh, and they're using it in really sort of fun ways. Like Mike talked about the Super Seawolf skeleton with the rainbow yep. sort of uh, night, but not like a traditional rainbow, like a kind of a... I don't know, 90s hypercolour, you know, rainbow bezel. Uh, we've mentioned many, many times now that I'm sure we're getting commission on any sales at this point, the uh, Warden and Mound Laser Tag Edition. Yep. Um, and, of course... Two, two variants there. Yeah. There's some other spicy uh, references, mostly in the Super Seawolf. What are you... 
what are you drawn to in their sort of coloured offerings, Andy? I mean, the, the I like the laser tag because it's not your like you've mentioned colour. It's not your standard colours. Like even the pineapple, the greens and the yellows they've chosen are sort of very tropical, but not tropical mm. in a in a palette that you would sort of immediately jump to. Like they're sort of yellowy greens that you might, if I describe them to you, you might not actually like. But when you see the execution, you know the whole package. You know the the packaging, the palm strap the palm on the box the, or the frongs like it, it it does work i think that the pineapple is is pretty cool i think the so there's two laser tags right there's the infrared yep. and the ultraviolet okay i think the ultraviolet which is like sort of the darker purple is pretty cool i like the even the patterns as well like the patterns that they put on the dial it's not most if brands most brands were to do this they do like a solid color dial and yep. a colorful bezel and that's it yep. whereas Zodiac, you know, the bezel has three or four different colors. The dial has six different colors and loom. The hands are different colors. Both hands are different colors with, you know, with loom. So there's three different colors on the handset. Like they really kind of throw color and boldness your way, but it's not, it's not kind of obnoxious. And it's not, you know, in the way of anything. Like it's sort of, it's the DNA, I think, of Zodiac these days. The other thing I appreciate is that it's not just limited to the limited editions. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's not uncommon for a brand to go, yeah, sure, we'll try a, a pink watch and they'll make 300 and if they sell, that's great. Some of their most popular, uh, certainly if I'm, you know, to take the website as a uh, clue, uh, models are their sort of core uh, Super Seawolves. Mm. The, there's the one with that watermelon bezel. Water, like that sort of pale pastel minty green is an odd choice, but they make it work, especially with the orange. And then there's the one with the white bezel and the orange highlights. So it's like they're part of the core collection and they're what, you know, they're maybe risks that the brand took that have now become fairly iconic in the modern day, mm. you know, part of the brand, which I think, I don't know, more brands need to, to do it and Zodiac do it really, really well. Yeah, well, they're doing the white ceramic as well in the Super Sea Wolf for 1800 US, white ceramic on a kind of, you know, so you can go for that similar sort of green dial, white ceramic case with the orange inner ring and then get like a nice textile kind of green rubber strap. Yeah. So you can kind of pick and choose the elements of the boldness and the colour because, yeah, like you said, it's not it's not super limited. Although that said, I think that the uh, Super Sea Wolf skeleton is getting pretty hard to, it's getting yeah. pretty hard to come by. Hearing that one's a tricky one to get down. And then the pineapple, every time I check, it seems to be sold out or nearly sold out. And then some more sort of stock comes up. But I reckon that'd be such a fun watch to wear. Uh, I've got a question for you. This is not just Zodiac exclusive. Mm -hmm. I'm, I think my stance on this is pretty well known. Uh, certainly looking over at my watch collection, which is, you know, pretty hectic. Where are you at on like color on watches? Oh, I love it. You know, we love colour. I think it's the more, like, if it's well done, the more the better. Okay. Yeah. Would you, is that, um, is that something that comes with experience or uh, more watches? Like, you know, the, yes. the traditional thing is like, you know, you buy a silver dial, you buy a black dial, then you maybe you get a blue one and then you start with, you know, hyper colour. Yeah, for sure. Because once you have the boring dials and the safe choices down, that's when you want to start having fun. You probably okay. wouldn't buy you know, say the rainbow skeleton as your first watch. You could. You could, but it probably wouldn't be your first and only watch. It's probably, I've got four or five watches. This is really fun and it speaks to me. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like you wouldn't buy, you know, a candy pink Rolex or the or whatever it is or the, the coral as your one and only. You probably mm. would have, you know, some boring black dial dive watches or a dress watch or whatever. And then you start to realise that they sort of, look the same and you want something that looks a bit different. Um, or a Zodiac say on the back of the pineapple, a slice of the good time. That's what, it's, that's what it says. I love it. Fair enough. Um, one other question uh, mm -hmm. about sort of colour in watches. Was there a point when colour became, and like that exuberant use of colour became cool or like became a trend or is it just has always been there or I think are we just looking at the outliers? I think 2020, I think the pandemic. Okay. It was sort of, it exploded to me. It was just everyone wanted something a bit more fun and kind of smile invo evoking on their wrist. Yeah, there were a lot of press releases about we need some happiness. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that was when Rolex did their colourful OPs, which was like a... I mean, obviously, they've done stellar dials and that sort of stuff 40 years ago. But I think the last time we saw that much kind of fun and interesting dials, whether it be patterns or colours or stones, was, you know, the 70s and 80s. I'm going to ping it a bit earlier than 2020, Andy, I reckon. I yep. reckon it was the Rolex uh, Rainbow, the more recent Rainbow. Oh, yep, the rose gold, yeah, yeah. Like it might have been a slower burn, but I reckon people are like, oh, this is fun. Like, obviously, you know, um, they yep. had that the Tigers watches. And like, there's, there's plenty throughout history, but I think that was a watch that was, like, cool and colourful mm. in the same sort of sentence, and that's where we started seeing other brands, like, pick up that this is something that might have a, a bit of, you know, it didn't have to be the... The weird. Yeah, yeah. It was, and it's sort of funny to see the more traditional brands go through like their take on color, like you know the c- certain houses going through that Art Deco style of like, oh, we could do a burgundy dial. I don't know, that's kind of crazy, or like a dark oh, hunter green. Or, yeah, oh, or burgundy, that. navy blue, and a and a dark green, and then <laughs> we'll do the same thing with some patterns, and then yeah, three years later, it's <laughs> zodiacs there with Photoshop. Pulling the filters all the way. Yeah, yeah. as much contrast as we can. More, <laughs> more. Uh, but yeah, what awesome. Hurt my eyes. So Dex is a great brand. I've um, been on my radar since I started reading. Literally worn and wound. One of the first sort of online watch publications. Uh, it's that price point where if you want to add to your collection, you can. You know, fifteen hundred, two grand. Easy, I'm easy really- buying. Um, it's a great brand for a first watch as well. Like it's one of the brands I've kind of toyed up with getting for my like first ever serious watch legit history uh the people there are legit the designs are legit the collaborations are legit so felix where can people check out zodiac watches say i'm in melbourne so i'm in australia where can i well australia uh, it's great uh easy answer there's one place there's time and tide uh they've got a physical shop in melbourne they've also got an online shop on the internet uh in other parts of the world best bet is to head to zodiacwatches.com we'll link it all up uh as per use Mm -hmm. um I don't know. It's. I think it's safe to say. Maybe. Maybe Jason Heaton's third book. Maybe he needs to get a zodiac in there. Maybe some there, color. Well, there's only one way to find out the uh, the watches in Sweetwater, the second of the Tusker series, and that is to get the man, the myth, and the honest to God legend Jason Heaton on the line. So many legends. Last time we spoke to Jason Heaton, he had just hit uh, print on his first novel, Depth Charge. Uh, that was a few years ago, and he's now got his sophomore novel, Sweetwater, which has just been launched uh, to, I, I'd like to say, worldwide acclaim. Uh, so we thought we should probably <laughs> get him on for a chat. Um, of course, Jason is more, much more than just the, the author of Rollicking Dive Adventures. He's uh, the co-host of The Grey NATO. Uh, a watch guy, and maybe the only person on this call who could actually win a season of Alone. Jason Heaton, how are you? <laughs> Don't sell yourself short now. <laughs> I think you could do it. I, Felix, I reckon you'd have a good crack at uh, I, don't, I don't have any of the skills. I could just sit there and not do much. Uh, You've got a bit of hidden strength. I reckon you could build a nice, a nice kind yeah, of... I've, maybe, maybe, I'll maybe. Too. I was trying yeah. to hype up the guest, Andy, but... You just need a gillnet. You need to get a gillnet working for you and you've got it. <laughs> That's a new word in my vocabulary after watching alone, you know, gillnet. It mm. seems like it's like, yeah. Are they those ones build a that like go in like a basket? This, no, no, they're like a yeah. net in the water where you just have it draped down and the fish kind of swim into uh, it. Okay. Like a tennis Obviously. net that you mm. string across a stream. It's yeah. make or break. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is a bit, yeah. They do do some training beforehand. Maybe I'll just pick it up quickly there. Well, <laughs> you, you've obviously watched it, Jason. But one of my favourite things is kind of watching the later seasons and seeing how they learn from previous contestants and previous yeah. seasons. So the Gilnet's yeah, yeah. a big one. And don't lose yeah. the uh, the fire starter, whatever that's called, the flint, flint stick. <laughs> how many times did that happen? It seems like people were losing those things all the time. <laughs> that, that, that seems pretty fundamental to me. If like, you know, yeah. first there yeah, was fire, then right. there was, you know, everything else. Yeah. Oh, look, I mean, we're talking about alone. Uh, how would you rate yourself in alone, Jason? Would you back yourself to win it, or are you? Uh, how many days? I think I'd do. I think I'd, I'd I'd put in a good strong showing. I'm not sure I could outlast some of these guys. You know, I'm not a. I, I don't call myself a hunter or, or fisherman um, sure. by any means. So I think I might struggle with the the the, the, the killing large animals kind of stuff mm-hmm. or setting mm-hmm. snares. But I think you know, I we, we'd probably all be surprised at the skills that would come out if we were pushed to the pushed to our limit. 
So yeah, yeah. I'd have you down for thirty. But I can I can tolerate house. cold, and I can, mm. you know, I can build stuff and that sort of thing. So yeah, I might do okay. Season ten, season eleven, one's coming up. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, aside from surviving the, the the cold, what's been happening? It's been a like we were saying offline a couple of years since we last had you on. I think it was for yeah. for the book book reading of Depth Charge, which we all loved and. Mm-hmm. It went really well. Tell yeah. us, tell us what's been happening. Yeah, I mean, you know, belated, much belated. Thanks for for having me on for that. It was uh, you guys were one of the first uh, first of anybody that I spoke to after that published, and and we did a little bit of a reading, and and that book sold well, and and people were were eager to get on with the second one, and and we can I guess get into it a bit, you know, as, uh, as much as you want, but the the second book was what largely consumed my past oh I would say twelve months at this point um, that and then. As I was saying before we started here, I, I kind of find myself, I found myself this year kind of back in the watch world, um, mm. kind of uh, just by chance, you know, just uh, did a few trips and uh, TGN's going well. So yeah, I would I would rate 2023 pretty high in my book. It was a good year. So uh, obviously we're here to talk about sweet water. So for anyone listening, you know, this will come out just before Christmas. I think there's maybe maybe still time to get a physical copy depending on where you are. Uh, certainly sure. a digital copy. Um, yeah. Can you give us the the top line summary of what the blurb to, to <laughs> yeah. you know, use a publishing term uh, of yeah. this novel? It, it is a sequel to, to Depth Charge um, in as much as, as the, the hero is the same. So it's, it's my... Uh, American underwater archaeologist uh, Julian Tusk, who goes by Tusker, and in Depth Charge we found him in Sri Lanka, kind of uh, going up against a, a rather nefarious villain uh, and his henchmen, one of whom was named Schultz, may or may not have been influenced by someone on this podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, so so th- you know he he got himself out of that mess, and then now we find him back in the U.S., closer to home. And this is a, an entirely different adventure. A few of the kind of supporting characters from Depth Charge pop up in this book. And uh, it involves some political intrigue. Uh, this time, instead of a shipwreck, it's a plane crash uh, deep underwater okay. that he uh, has to investigate. And uh, it was kind of inspired by a couple of... Uh, a couple of incidents that I was reading about in the news. I think, you know, nowadays there's no shortage of good plots that pop up in the news. You know, mm. there's, I mean, underwater pipelines in the, in the Baltic that are, that are being blown up that, you know, just they almost write themselves. Um, but yeah, there was, there was this particular plane crash not far up the road from me here in which a, a senator was, was killed in a plane crash back in, I would say, I think it was the early 2000s. Um, yeah, right. I just was always intrigued by that. It always seemed a little strange. And uh, so that kind of got me on my way to uh, spinning up a plot for this one. And yeah, I'm pretty pleased with the way this one turned out. I think I think people will find it a little bit darker in terms of the tone of the book, uh, a little more introspective. Tusker's a bit more of a, I don't want to say damaged, but he was definitely affected by the events of Depth Charge. Yeah. And, and we find him kind of dealing with that and revisiting some of his family history. Uh, there's some flashbacks in which his father's own story kind of comes up in this book. So, and of yeah, course, so for, for the audience, you know, there's plenty of watch content in it as well. So, I, I finished reading it. I, I whizzed through it in a couple of days. Um, oh, nice. That's why you've been so mm-hmm. offline, Felix. Haven't been able to get through to him. You've been consumed by Sweetwater. No, well, I mean, it's, <laughs> it was it was a great uh, because I knew we had this coming up, so I could legitimize it as kind of work. <laughs> so you go, it's just, and it was it was very much you, you you know your sort of your page turnery thrillery sort of you know um uh content so and it's not not particularly uh stressful or you know you don't have to take too much time with it it's a pretty you know um i'm, yeah. I'm gonna say airplane sort of novel but i don't mean that in any sort of pejorative sense yeah. um uh it, it it came across to me as very much a sort of you've matured as a writer as as the character has matured as well um yeah i i can't remember what i was originally going to say there um <laughs> were you surprised I'm, by the ending i think many people have said they were surprised by the ending Did no I, there, there were two no. things that that that, uh, that i sort of came back to about it one was i liked this is two questions in one i've remembered what i was going to ask mm-hmm. um I liked the father sort of flashbacks and that was, mm-hmm. um, you know, not giving too much away. He was also a sort of former military diver. Um, would you ever consider 
coming, you know, writing a story from Tusca Senior in some sort of Tusca mm. expanded cinematic universe. Um, like, the a prequel. Ooh, like a prequel. Like a prequel. Mm. Oh, yeah. And the oh, second it one... It didn't occur to me. Yeah, it, did no, it didn't occur to me until until recently. And then I thought, you know, I can see why people write prequels or why they do prequel films because yep. it is a tantalizing option. It's there now. I've, I've built this character yep. Uh, yep. with some depth, pardon the pun, but, you yep. know, and, and I think there's something to be mined there. So who knows? Yeah, and I mean, it, I mean, it sort of certainly allows you to explore that that love of like military gear and, and that world in a more yeah, sort of definitely fleshed way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But coming back to your point about the political nature and that potentially dark ending, uh, given the, you know, the world context in which it was written, where, you know, th there's clear that that influence is there of, you know, political scheming and shenanigans. Did yeah. you find yourself having to alter alter any of that as uh, as the world's environment moved along? Like, because, I, you know, there's a, a subplot with Russia, again, not mm -hmm. going too much into detail. Yeah. Was that kicking off uh, as you were writing it or was that not a concern for you? Um, I think, you know, even before the, the, the conflict in Ukraine kicked off, um, we had some in this country, obviously, some questions uh, about a past president's uh, influence, you know, from from mm. the other side of the world. And, and you know, I, I just think that that's a rich vein to mine anyway. I think that 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 look, there's there's never, you know, in this country, there, people have been talking about plots and political influence from other countries back to the Manchurian candidate or you sure. know, JFK assassination, etc. So I think people just seem to like those stories and I think they're just, they're just so rich for, for picking, you know? And, and so, you know, it didn't really take necessarily any current events or, or recent history to, to, to make me think of that. Uh, as I mentioned, it was, it was partially inspired by a kind of a mysterious plane crash that happened here with our, our own state of Minnesota's Senator, uh, back, I don't know, probably 15, 15 or so years ago. And, and that always kind of stuck in my head as something that would bear more investigation or writing about or fictionalizing. So that's kind of what I did. I'm I've not read it yet. I'm old school, so I need to get a paperback copy because I can't oh, I yeah. can't do the the Felix um, screen time. But I, I'll have to grab one. But I'm curious as to how much better you think you got sort of writing a second book and all those learnings you get sort of after releasing it and all the feedback and you know good, bad, ugly, whatever whatever it was. But you just, it's such a weird thing to kind of step out and do for the first time. I can only imagine that you think this second book is exponentially better. Yeah, I do. I, I think, whereas I think Depth Charge was more of, when I set out to write Depth Charge back in 2020, mm. um, I had this notion of, I had, I had you know, kind of plowed through all of the Ian Fleming Bond novels, mm. some Clive Cussler, which I'm a little on the fence about in terms of my own tastes, um, Alistair McLean, things like that. And I thought, you know, the thrillers that were given these days, a lot of them are kind of Jack Carr, John Grisham, mm. you know, uh, Dan Brown, Child. et cetera. And Lee Child, yeah. 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 Lee Child. And, and there's a lot of, a lot of swagger, a lot of big masculine characters, you know, ex-military, lots of gunplay, um, that sort of thing. The, the, the characters often seem in, infallible, you know, mm. like you look at, at a Dirk Pitt and it's like every decision he makes is the right one. He just comes across <laughs> so smart and so tough and, you know, and I, I always wanted to, to kind of riff off of that formula, but with a more flawed character and, and stronger female characters. Um, but, but yet tap into that, that vein of like really great villains from, from kind of the Bond novels and, and so that's kind of what I did with Depth Charge. And I think the book, you know, it's set in Sri Lanka. It's a more exotic place to most people. Um, and I think that the villain was a little larger than life. With mm. Sweetwater, I think it, it's, it, you know, Felix, you'd have your own opinion about this, but I, I feel like it's a bit more of a quieter, um, the, the plot feels a little more grounded. Um, the villains are a little more realistic. And I think what I learned from one book to the next was in, in order to kind of craft a, a good, solid, kind of plot and storyline and keep the timeline straight in my head 
take the time before I sat down to write each chapter mm. and, and map out the entire book. So I actually did that. I did not do that with Depth Charge. Uh, you know, really? I had never written a novel before that. And I, so I remember painting myself into corners with Depth Charge where I would have to back out and figure out like who's doing what, where, and when, and oh boy, I forgot about this. And you know, now I've got to change whole chapters. With this one, I had the whole timeline like on a large sheet of paper that I had hash marks on and I could go back and right. forth and refer to that. Did you use any so, like, um, uh, I know, the sort of publishing tools for like planning novels and like that sort of logic flow, nothing like no. that. No, no, it was all it was literally paper and pen on a, on a big white pad, which I have somewhere here. Um, it's just the way I work. It was just easy to just kind of do you know whatever they call them bubble and stick diagrams and big yeah, like just a, literally just a big timeline. Have you and, have you got a bit of a yeah. universe planned out? Like, can we expect a bunch more books? Do you think this is going to be this is sort of a serious part of your future. I mean, I won't lie. If I, if if that's if if I could choose a way to kind of, you know, I'm I'm advancing in age these days. Of course, we aren't the young. We were talking about that too. We aren't the young, you know, first gen sort of watch bloggers that we used to be. And mm -hmm. and as I'm kind of moving through my career, I think that'd be kind of a neat neat way to sort of you know ease into sort of retirement age. You know, older older age would be to, to just write novels. I would, I would love to do that. That would be a, a dream of mine. It's, a, it's probably fairly unrealistic, but um, I, I do want it to be a, a big part of my life only because mm. it, I think it brings me the most pleasure. It's, it's just pure fun. It's absolute pure joy to, to just come up with stuff out of the blue. I can, I can make my characters the, the, the larger than life people. I can put myself into characters. I can put People I don't like, I can make them into villains. No offense, Felix. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm okay being a villain. Yes, yeah. You were Obviously, a good henchman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think it will continue. Yeah, I'll, I'll just take one at a time, but yeah, definitely. Uh, it's interesting that you say it's sort of, you know, uh, a, a different tone of this book. And, you know, you sort of said the first one, Sri Lanka, was a bit more exotic for most uh, I thought this was very closer to home because this is an area you're very familiar with, that sort of Great Lakes uh, mm -hmm. part of the world. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering how much, there's a lot of, you know, for anyone that knows you and follows you, there's a lot of, clearly you're both interested in diving. You've, there's a, how much Tusker is in Heaton and how much Heaton is in Tusker? I don't think there's much Tusker in Heaton. I think... Uh... I think there's a, there's probably a fair bit of me in him because I think I suppose any writer will tell you that he puts himself into or herself into his or her characters in in some sense. It's it's really you write what you know and and the most familiar. So you know you'll see references to watches and Blundstone boots and you know barber jackets and old Land Rovers and things yeah. like this. I mean clearly people don't have to guess too, too hard, hard. where, where yeah. all that comes from. But it, it, it to me it's it's what I enjoy in life and I think you know my my hero my protagonist is you know he's he's the one through whose eyes you're, you're seeing most of the story and so maybe at some point as you mentioned earlier a prequel where we're going back to to Jonathan Tusk and Julian's father um, and, and set it back in the 60s or, or 70s would um, that would change you know I'd have to step out of my own kind of eyeballs and Mm. and visit somebody else's uh, brain, I guess, or somebody else's life. So, yeah. Amazing. For, so I've not read it, Felix has. Can you kind of surmise plot without giving away any spoilers, just for the, for the people listening, get them to buy a copy afterwards? Yeah, yeah. So in this book, um, you know, Tusker's about a year back from his last adventure in Sri Lanka, and he's uh, living in the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is on Lake Superior. Uh, arguably the largest lake in the world, at least by surface area. And he teaches underwater archaeology there. And uh, in the book, he's kind of going through some some tough times, kind of coming to terms with, with some of his things that he faced in Sri Lanka. And at the same time, he gets this email from a reporter asking about a certain plane crash that happened back in the 1970s that his father, who was a Navy diver at the time, happened to be part of the investigation into what caused this crash. And 
Tusker doesn't think much of this, but as kind of things start to unfold, he starts to uncover, as he's looking back into some of his father's memorabilia and mementos at his home, he comes across some evidence that suggests that maybe there was more to this plane crash than than was reported initially. Mm -hmm. And as he digs deeper, he kind of finds himself embroiled in a, a bit of a, a nefarious plot uh, that that happens to coincide with an upcoming presidential election. So he delves into this uh, almost reluctantly at first, but then you know, like he kind of almost has no choice. And also involved is a, a certain reporter, a woman from one of the newspapers in Michigan, the Detroit Free Press, and she's investigating this. And so they kind of team up in this investigation. And Tusker also has help from an old friend of his, uh, you know, he's, there's, there's just a few characters that, that kind of help him along the way. And so I, I if I, t if I say any more, it'll probably start to, to yeah. spoil it a bit, but uh, that's um, kind of where we're at. Top notch hench person this time. Uh, oh, thank you. Really well done. That was a, that was a great, uh, side character. Oh, uh, great. Thank you. Who was well, inspired by? Not me. I'm not guessing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you will find out quickly that is not inspired by Felix this time. Um, no, there's a, there's a certain woman who uh, who I know who um, w was very vocally um, kind of volunteered to be a hench person. Oh, great! Uh, after depth charge uh, last time around, I held a little bit of a contest last time with, after oh, depth charge. I had some T-shirts made. Yes. Uh, that would, I, I don't know if you remember in Thunderball. Um, the whole crew of of the the Disco Volante, which was the the villain's boat, all wore like crew T shirts, and I always had this idea in my head that you know I'm, I, I kind of enjoy the marketing side of things and, and merchandise anyway, and so I thought I'm going to make hench person T shirts, and so I held a bit of a contest and I said whoever posts like the most convincing story and photo on Instagram, you know, convincing me that they're a hench person, I will send a free T shirt. So I did that, and this woman that responded. Um, was one of them, and she 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 lives it. I mean, she 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 looks the part. She's tough as nails, etc. Yeah. And again, I don't want to give too much away, but um, she she kind of fit the bill, and was more than happy to kind of be a a bit of a model for that character. That's and cool. So hopefully, I did sure. did right by her. I she's mean, a very pleasant nice. person. She's a very nice person. She's not not evil in any way. So but that's all. Awesome. Yeah, well um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Austin Powers also did the henchman thing. Um, but maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly yeah, <I'm> sure. <laughs> of, of course, uh, it would not be a Jason Heaton novel without some meaningful watch inclusions. Uh, yeah. What I really liked is that there's, there's not too much, too much, not too much watch, which is, I think, right. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but the watches are actually used and sort of serve as important plot devices. Uh, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you work out like sort of characterizing a watch? or like finding the right piece or way to implement it? You know, it was fairly important to me to include watches for a number mm. of reasons. One, one of which, you know, I'm a full-on watch nerd and, and yeah. love kind of, I mean, you can't have a, a dive thriller without some dive watches in it. But I, I was really careful because I realized that I don't want to limit my audience to people that are just going to nerd out about watches, despite mm. the fact that everybody who has been buying the book and posting photos of it, always put a watch on top of it, which has kind of become a bit of a hook. You know, it's kind of yeah. a fun a fun thing. But um, I don't want to lay it on too thick. I, mm. I, I really did not want to um, go into detail about a specific reference of a yep. watch or, you know, the have the Tusker going the shopping. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Unlike I the mean, reference I, before, I, I, this one has an updated silicon escape man. <laughs> yeah. Copy paste to Ninky <laughs> review. Done. <laughs> it's little Easter eggs, right? Little Easter eggs. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I remember reading, there was a series of books called The Doc Ford Mysteries that was written by an American novelist named Randy Wayne White. And I always liked the books. And again, this guy was like a marine biologist who lived in some swampy area of Florida and he would always get himself into these issues, these, these mysteries. And they were going fine. I think they mentioned that he had a Rolex at some point. And then one book popped up and he was wearing a Graham swordfish. And, and it was, it wasn't just a, you remember Graham, the watch brand, then they yeah, had this yeah. dive watch called the swordfish. Yep. And it was such a specific reference. It was like, I don't remember the, specifically the Graham models now, but it was like the Graham swordfish night mission, you know, 
DLC or whatever it was. It had this big name and it was like it popped up in the book and it ruined it for me. It's an I just thought watch. you can't be that specific. You can't, especially with a brand like that. You know, I'm like tonight I'm wearing my, my Bremont Supermarine. I, I felt like there are certain brands that would fit in a book and certain mm. that wouldn't. Now, a Bremont would be a great watch for, for a protagonist in a book like this. But like Bremont's not going to resonate necessarily or make sense it, it to an audience like that maybe isn't into inclusion. watches. Yeah, they need to pay, they Ex- need to there pay you a go. bit of money. That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you sell these directly from your shop, jasonheatonauthor.com. Yes, Signed copies. I do. And they're on Amazon as well. And Felix, I believe a now bookstores can bookstores can get them printed through Amazon. I believe Amazon works as a distributor. But Amazon or, or basically. Nah, we'll go yeah, direct to you. Felix, do you, want a, you want a printed copy? I'm just using your credit card to buy a couple now. <laughs> sure, <laughs> why not? <laughs> <Done>. <laughs> Purchase. Business write off, yeah, yeah. Done. Um, Two copies. <laughs> I want special messages in there. JasonHeatonAuthor.com. That's where to. That's where uh, to get it. You're, you're going to get that um, is, email. Is this my Christmas present, Andy? Is this what? <laughs> Thanks, Felix. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a question. Uh, speaking of the, the business side of books, uh, in your um, uh, afterward, I haven't read the afterward. Uh, mm-hmm. You talked yeah. about how you explored like using a literary agent, and like you, you spoke to a literary agent, mm. and you uh, self-published. Yeah. What was that process like um, and why did you in the end decide to sort of go your own way? Well, when I was in the process of kind of completing the manuscript for Sweetwater, um, I also write a, a weekly Substack uh, kind of blog and, and one of my subscribers, a fellow named Michael, um, is a, is a literary reviewer, but he also was a first-time novelist. And he wrote to me privately and said, if you're interested, um, I'd be happy to connect you with an agent that I've gone through who happened to help mm. me get my book published. And so I said, great. So he made the introduction. I sent my manuscript. The agent was based in Belfast in Northern mm-hmm. Ireland. Um, and he, he liked the story. He helped me edit the manuscript. He had a good list of publishing contacts to reach out to. And when I finalized it in... It was almost exactly one year ago when I finalized the book. He started sending it out, and we started to get some feedback, some very good feedback. Uh, some of the editors at publishing houses were, they enjoyed the story. They said, this isn't really in our wheelhouse. This isn't the type of book we're looking for. Um, a lot of just you know, radio silence from some of them, sure. whatever. Um, and as we were working through it, about halfway through the year, so about six months into this process of kind of waiting and getting a few notes of feedback. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had another conversation with this this author, Michael, and he was telling me about the process that he went through and how long it took. And I, I quickly realized that even if a publisher accepts this book, it could be another two or three years before it right. sees the light of day. Yeah. You and do, then I was know. remembering back. I thought I need momentum. I I, I liked the process yep. in depth charge of stuff like making the T-shirts, and mm. I always include stickers with the signed copies that I, I had made by the designer, the wonderful designer Paul Andrews that I used for the cover. Um, I, I just like marketing, and I like doing these podcasts. I like doing having my own mm. website and designing you, the got cover the and skills so, and networks and audience mm, to exactly. Be able to sustain it. Yeah. I have look. I have in terms of. In our world, I would say my reach is fair sized in terms yep. of social media and, and co hosting a podcast. Yep. In terms of making a bestseller, like 100,000 copies, no, I, I, I can't do that. But I do okay with my own little network. And yeah. so I've just made that decision. And I told my agent, I said, I'd like to self publish this. Let's give it till the end of August. And so we did. And he was very happy to do that. And uh, we kind of left on good terms. And, and so then at, at the end of August, I just pulled the trigger and approached Paul, my cover designer. We whipped up a cover. He did the typesetting. Yep. I had a friend do the proofing and off it went. And lo and behold, it, it went live in early November and that's where we're at. So, and, and happily it happened to be right at, you know, the, the holiday time and people seem to be enjoying buying them for gifts. I got on corporate things. credit cards for that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's work expense. It's a work expense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. For right. Felix anyway. No, I don't have to worry about yeah. it. <laughs> Is there, um, have you noticed any typos in the book? Oh, Andy, can't ask that. It's, it's the worst feeling noticing a typo know. after something's been printed. Well, I will say this, uh, and feel free to tell me, but I, I was reading a, a wonderful book. I just finished it yesterday 
you might be familiar with our friend uh, Oren Hartov. I don't know sure. if you've met him. He, yeah. So Oren's father is an author, novelist, and, and I've just finished a book by him. Wonderful book, actually. Uh, it was called The Last of the Seven. I'll put in a little plug for him. Mm -hmm. But I caught one typo in the book, and it was just like if instead of it or something like that. And it's funny how I noticed that because I don't have a particular eye for detail mm. at that level. Um, but in Depth Charge, and I'm not going to call out who I had proofed yeah. that book or anything like that, but like I did, there were a few errors in that book and, and some actual factual errors that I, if I ever do a second edition, I will correct. Um, with Sweetwater, I used someone that I really trust and I think he did a great job and he not only proofed it for things like typos, which I hope there were very few, uh, he also um, was, was very valuable in his input about his experience with, you know, Navy diving and yeah, okay. knowledge about that area. So it was, it was a good, I, I feel more confident about the quality of this book in general. A unique yes. set of skills. Uh, well, yeah. And speaking of, you're obviously, you're geared up to do audio recordings. Are we getting an audio book? So yes. Um, hey. I'll tell you what, my, my dilemma about audiobooks, even going back to depth charge, because people mm -hmm. have been asking me for a couple of years now, um, first of all, I approached, I put out a call for auditions to professional narrators and I got like 50 auditions, some which were tremendous, really, mm -hmm. really good. Some which were really, pretty bad. And, and yet then I was hearing from a lot of people saying, <clears throat> we just wish you would do it yourself. You have yeah. a, a good voice for it. You've got recording gear. And that's really what my preference has been was, was to, to do the audiobooks myself because I, I, I couldn't bear the thought of somebody mispronouncing, especially in Depth Charge, where you had, have a lot of Sri Lankan town names, mm. people's names, specific places, e even in this book, regional stuff that, that could very easily be gotten wrong. And I thought of my, I'd be obsessively listening to every bit of that recording and always having to tweak and go back and have them correct. It'd be easier for me to do it. But my dilemma was, what do you do about accents? Um, especially in depth charge. Mm -hmm. A lot of it takes place in Sri Lanka. There's several Sri Lankan characters. And, uh, there are some professional narrators that will emulate specific accents, a, mm -hmm. a Northern English accent, an Australian accent, etc. And um, so that was kind of my roadblock. I thought, I, I can't do those myself. I will not even attempt. I'll make a fool of myself and embarrass myself and uh, insult people. And then I, you know, I've, I've realized lately that it's actually become a bit of a thing where to emulate accents is considered somewhat offensive and kind of taboo yeah. in some quarters. Mm. And I don't want to do that. So it, in a way it's kind of freed me from having to even do accents. Yep. So I, I, I just thought I will just read it in my voice. Mm. I can maybe alter the pitch a little higher for a, a yeah. female character or something, but I'm not going to attempt, you know, I think, I think Ian's you can, uh, English accent or whatever. So, yeah. You can evoke a, a character in mm. a different way, not just through accent. You know, like the obvious one mm -hmm. is, you know, I'm not going, you know, no one here is going to try and do, a, you know, a Sri Lankan accent without, you know, I would say yeah. it's being offensive in the year of 2023. Yeah. But I think there's yeah. other ways you yeah. can come that, get that character across. It's, it, right. I think it's e evocation as opposed to imitation, which mm -hmm. is the, mm -hmm. um, yeah, right. Right, do it. So we're getting one? Yeah, 100%. It's happening. Yeah. It's confirmed here. Yeah. Yeah. And right, I think that, I'm just going to do two books just back to back, just, just do them. And I've had, um, a couple of friends, one of whom, you know, well, and you just met in Dubai recently, sure. uh, my co-host, uh, has kindly offered to help with the production and he's obviously a wonderful audio editor. Cut right. I have a, I have a, uh, you know, with depth charge, I had a good friend here who's a music com composer and producer, and he composed a little theme. It's on the website. Uh, if, if you go, there's a, a link, I think it's called music or score. Yeah. And, and there's a bit of a theme music that he composed and it's so evocative. It, it has this sort of old school John Barry bond theme sort of thing. And I always like that in audiobooks where it got, kind of, it fades in, you know, with a little bit of music at the beginning and yeah. we can incorporate that. So yeah, I think we could have fun with it. Oh, Oh yeah, huh. there we go. Well, this is interesting. I like this. I feel like I'm being um, uh, kicked off the stage at a speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, that's that's lovely. See, these are nice touches yeah. that you can do because you're doing it yourself. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, it's not just it's not just um, death charge though in your life. You mentioned uh, you know your your TGN co-host. How's that part of the world going? How is the world of um, gear and most certainly watches? Uh, it, it's been a really good year on that front as well. We had some 
some great guests on the show. Um, most notably, I think uh, a highlight was Don Walsh, the first one of the first two men to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, who just died a few weeks ago. Um, he, we mm. had him as a guest on this past summer. Um, the community continues to grow, and one thing that we've really enjoyed was we added, I don't know if you're familiar, you probably are, with Slack, kind of the community, online community yep. tool that a lot of businesses use for, for communicating within a company or whatever. We, we launched that for our subscriber base, yep. and it's become, it's transcended the podcast. I think people are thrilled to be part of this to, to sign up as a subscriber in order to only okay sure they get the podcast but they they get access to this community and it's we have well over a thousand people in that community oh. and they're all just contributing i mean I, I can't even keep up and i first when we talked about doing this i thought how are we going to moderate this and keep up with this and it almost kind of self-polices itself the people are awesome. I've, I've never had such a, a robust kind of group of really kind helpful like polite people in one place i mean you, you know i'm sure you guys have spent Canadians, enough time on watch forums and in and in the comments of like you know hodinky articles people just get so snipey and negative and there's none of that there isn't yeah. even a swear word i mean this is it's the most cordial bunch very helpful um it, it's 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 been a game changer it's really really been well i've got felix's um, corporate card out again so change. maybe i'll <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, we, we, we didn't go with Slack. We went with Discord and, you know, we might not have a thousand people, but very similar experience. It's, yeah, and, and I think it's that it is, you know, not to sound like the old guys in the room, as we were talking about before, it's that old forum experience of, mm. you know, it's, there's less of that uh, visibility around, you know, say the Instagram comment section. So there's, uh, you right. know, it's a nicer place to be. So. Yeah, it's sort of, yeah. it's like a home on the internet for this. You're right, because the comment section on, you know, places like Kodinki has gotten a little bit, I mean, obviously pretty nasty at times. And then the rest of watch social media is fast moving and TikToks. And to me and Felix, I think yeah. definitely unrelatable at this point. And then you have right. guys that just anonymously join our Discord. And I mean, we, we had one incident where <laughs> someone someone joined and sent some inappropriate things, but we, we changed the controls there. But otherwise, it's it's like a lovely. It's a couple hundred people, so yeah, not as, not yeah, as big, big yeah. as yours yet. Um, yeah, but, and, um, and I'm at a point where I'm fairly familiar with a bunch of their personalities. I'm like, oh, yeah. Dave eighty two's fired up again, you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> Sorry if you're listening, Dave. Uh, yeah, but it is yeah. fun. It's fun. That's cool. We'll have to. Um, yeah, we'll join up. I won't do it now. And I, I love the theme music as well. Maybe we'll um, we'll grab a, a copy and we can use it as the intro music or something. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. One thing I saw you pop, I think, was uh, it was your Substack, which we'll also link up uh, as per mm -hmm. the artificial rules of mutually supporting podcasts. Um, <laughs> you were talking about you you got out your watch collection and like played with it, a la Barbie yeah. dolls. Yeah, as, yeah. Uh, you know, and I find people that work in watches' relationship to watches fascinating. Like I've always struggled to keep the watches I own and enjoy as things that I, you know, wear for myself different to, you know, my professional life. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy, I think, to get burnt out and sort of, you know, or, or like have that, you know, I need the latest, I need the greatest, whatever it is. Yeah. Has spending time away from, you know, that 100% professional watch life made you fall back in love with watches or did you just need to have some time away or is it is it are you moved on in your life from that period of i, I think session? i think all of that i think i've i've you know when i was kind of deep into the the, the show cycle of sihh and basel world mm -hmm. and you know going on press trips every month and getting review watches and writing all those reviews it, it just it took it took the fun away, and and I remember even even with my own watches for a very long time, and I would even argue to, to this day. I I think with every new watch that I acquire, uh, I'm still looking for that initial buzz that I got from my very first watch. You know that that feeling you get with with the, that very first watch. All of us remember that, yeah. whether it was in high school or earlier or later, or maybe just your first good watch, so to speak. Um, I'm always looking to recapture that. And then you kind of get into that cycle of, nope, that's not it. The next, maybe the next one, maybe the next one. And 
I think I've kind of stepped off that carousel and, you know, I've acquired some, some nice watches this year and I've, I've actually felt like I'm finally kind of getting back to enjoying them. Some of them sort of came almost serendipitously and some mm. yeah. not, but, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm having fun again. I, I still remember, so I think when we talk about it, I think you did a, did a write up for Hodinki sort of about that sort of the grail was a longer that you sort of were toying with and debating getting for a long time and then it just didn't you couldn't make it make sense you know consolidating mm-hmm. down to get it and then it wouldn't be something you want so now you're back you're back sort of enjoying the kind of consuming side of it have you ha, did you let some watches go to kind of get to that point or, or what have you what have you picked up that has has been worth picking up that you're like interested in i, th- I would think so one of the most significant pieces I guess in my collection in general, but also mm. um, one that just almost literally fell in my lap was a uh, first generation, like a first year Breitling Navitimer, 1954 Navitimer. Oh, cool. And it's a watch that I've long admired. I've loved Navitimers despite my uh, kind of predilection towards diving watches. I, a friend of a friend found no, you know, no joke, a 1954 Navitimer in a thrift store for 50 cents. Whoa. You know, 50 cents in any currency is cheap. I don't care if, you know, if it's Australian dollars or British pounds or anything. I mean, 50 cents is 50 cents. And, and he's not a watch guy, but he, he recognized it as something interesting and got in touch with me to, to get some insights into it. And I, I told him I will research it. Uh, I took it. I, I looked at the movement. I took pictures. I contacted a couple of very respected and well-known vintage dealers here in the U.S., uh, for some estimates and passed those on to him and said, I'd be happy to help you sell it, but I, I got to say, I'd, I'd love to have this for myself. And so I ended up with that watch. That's cool. And it's just it was just one of those amazing stories that that we all hear about and dream about. And and while I didn't pay 50 cents, certainly, uh, it's it's just such a meaningful piece. And I wore it for like a month straight after getting it, you know, despite its really poor water resistance and age. Uh, you know, that that's one watch that I think the means by which I came by it as well as its significance and just yeah. it's, it's a beautiful piece. Uh, was like just such a high point for me this year as well as a couple of new dive watches that I got. You know, I got the, the Pelagos FXD which is a watch that oh, I could, lovely. could almost retire with just one watch on my wrist. I think it would be that one. I just can do everything. So so you're, you're still uh, quite engaged with new watches like you're, you're seeing a new release and feeling that ooh, uh, you, know, it, you know, I need to buy that. Should I pop down to the boutique sort of Feel? Very few. Very yeah. few watches do that for me anymore. Um, I happened to be on this uh, press trip to Florida for the launch of that black dial FXD. Yep. And there was quite a few people there. And I wasn't there as press. I was there as a, they asked me, Tudor asked me specifically to come and do underwater photography. Yep. Because they had all these press people there that would want underwater photos of them wearing the watch for their stories. Yep you know, for, for Warren and Wound or for, for Tello, et cetera. And so I happily did it. And then when it came time, came time to send my invoice, I, I, I had gotten so smitten with that watch, being able to wear it and be around it for a few days that I said, can I drop payment in a watch? Yeah. Nice. And they said, sure, we can do that. So they, they engraved the back for me with a very meaningful, you know, engraving and, and very poor business decision on my part. But, uh, I but mean, I don't know. There was just something about that piece that just, I, just captivated me. It just has yeah. everything going for it. Um, it is. Um, so. It does feel quite old school in its sort of aesthetic. Like it, it, you know, it's obviously a modern watch, but it doesn't feel. Yeah. Like it's been designed with a, that sort of, you know, modern product way. It feels more sort of tool right. in some ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's also. It's, it's this sweet spot where, you know, those of us in the know are like, oh yeah, Tudor is a part of Rolex. You know, we like to kind of say that, but it's not Rolex. And, and so it has this quality kind of built into it and, and this history, but it feels like, especially, you know, a, a watch like that, that you can only wear on a single piece, you know, it comes with like a Velcro strap. I mean, that seems so cheap and so, mm. you know, but it's like, it's, it's this perfect sort of high, low, it's all matte straps you know it's just it's it's really kind of a perfect it's just a a neat neat watch really great release this year you have to find a gray nato for it i'm looking for oh i have a (laughs) i've got a question no sorry i've got a question for jason this is a i need i don't need i want a good quality aftermarket velcro strap like Mm. that shooter strap 
Yeah. Do you have any any hookups? Twenty two millimeter. The the guy that I would have suggested you go to, he, Gas Gas Bones. Yes, he steps in and out of the business like every other month. You know, um, I've got a few of his old straps and. And he was always the go-to guy. I'm trying to think who else makes a good Velcro strap. If I come across one, I'll I'll send it to you. I'll I mean, send you the, a link or something. But yeah, yeah, I think yeah. Velcro is fun, is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I think Phoenix NATO shut down, right? I think they. Do they Phoenix Velcro? is now, yeah. Phoenix NATO has now shut the doors. I think the the owner, longtime owner, just retired. He was just done. Um, not Velcro certainly, but like I still think you know they're the the, the kind of the, the thinnest kind of most cheaply made sort of hardware of any NATO, but like the, the weave on the material and the color is you can't be beat. You can't beat that Admiralty gray that they, they produce. They're such good straps. So if you've got them, hold on to them. Yeah. Well, I had someone direct message me trying to buy up because I knew I'd oh. picked up a bunch over the years and they're trying to, trying to oh, grab nice. them off me. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll hold on to mine for another two years and then put them on eBay. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Like they were offering yeah, more than like yeah. the, whatever the retail price was, it was a couple hundred dollars. Incredible. So. Yeah, 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 it's an interest there. It's good. it's hard to find. Well, Jason, yeah. we've I've ordered two copies. We're gonna join up to Substack, uh, and we'll get into the Slack as well. <laughs> if and I can. We'll My goodness, they, this was a, this was. I, I'm glad I came on today. We'll have a, <laughs> Doing yeah, a little business here. Made money. Um, yeah, we'll have a, we can have yeah. like a couples account, like Andy and Felix. OT. <laughs> it's just OT. It's a business partnership. You'll that's, never know right. who it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's how we subscribe to Chris Hall's fifth. You know. Newsletter. <laughs> I've I've checked out via FedEx, so I'm hoping it's here for Christmas and I can have something to read over the, the holiday break. I got the I see the order here. I will well, have it out tomorrow. It'll uh, it'll be there within the week, I'm sure. Amazing. Yeah. A little personalized message. That, that's what you get if you buy it from Jason Heaton or Yeah. And, a couple Amazon, of cool stickers. Uh, yeah, you get stickers. Is there gonna be a t shirt competition? Because I want I love a t shirt. Um you know, the I I loved doing the t shirts and I, I'm not gonna say no because in my heart, I would love to do it, but man, stocking different sizes and yeah. all the giant boxes of t-shirts in the basement that's, and shipping them was, yeah, it's painful. That was rough. That's rough. But yeah. You get a cool Stupid t-shirt hats. out of it. Yeah. 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 And Amazing. Little, uh, little watch caps for the cold Canadian, mm. you know? Yeah. It's yeah. the same. It's the something same. Something without pain. a size. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Something. One size fits most. Yeah. Caps, coffee mugs. Totes. Something. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Coffee mug would be good. God, it's, uh, it's yeah. endless options. Well, we will link yeah. everything up and I can't wait to read uh, Sweetwater. Well, thanks for having me on. This was yeah. a blast. Good to, good to chat with you guys again. Our pleasure. Andy, this wraps up a trilogy of legendary uh, interviews. We had we had Hammer, we had JCB, and then we've got Heaton. Three, the, the Mount Rushmore of watch industry legends right there um honestly really really great always to chat to jason Heaton. he's such a gentleman in the the truest sense of the word uh thank you very much for that jason thank you also to zodiac and everyone there for you know continuing to support it the podcast thank you to everyone listening andy what are the terms and conditions that people need to be aware of Okay, so after change to Jason, we may need to get a Substack. We're going to keep the Discord, but maybe I'm going to make Felix run a Substack every every oh. week. It's too late to get out of that. Uh, but let us know. Join our Discord. Of course, give five star reviews. Make sure you're telling your friends online, offline about the podcast. It all helps get the word out there. Share it. Follow us on Instagram, ot.podcast, and email us at ot.thepodcast.com. And of course, make sure you check out both of Zodiac. ZodiacWatches.com and JasonHeatonAuthor.com. Support everyone who's beautifully done, Andy. See you next week. Christmas. Cue as Sweetwater outro music. Bye.